All right. Good morning, KW Prosperity. It's Matt and Mary Beth with you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So today we're at uh, tactic number 12, which is titled Bulletproof the Transaction Issues and Solutions. So, uh, you know, Mary Beth, before we dive into this chapter, one thing that I, you know, I was reading through this chapter, there's a lot of content, so we'll be breaking up in two days. Uh, yet one thing I, I, that did kind of hit me is that the first 11 tactics are really more about finding business, getting business, uh, pricing right, working with buyers, all of that type of stuff. Yet now we're at the stage of the transaction where okay, we've got the business, we've written the offer, now something's under contract, how do we keep it together? Um, because ultimately this chapter talks about how you're going to deal with buyer's remorse or, you know, buyer's reluctance or maybe buyer's, you know, trying to, to, to walk out. So, uh, you know, that's really just kind of setting the table for this chapter. Um, but I do want to read the quote by Abraham Lincoln real quick at the top of page 241 for tactic number 12. Um, he says, if I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six sharpening my axe. And... I think that really embodies this entire chapter because it's all about keeping your head up and making sure that you're aware of everything that's going on around you and making sure that everything's falling in line. Um, you know, so that kind of sets up for this chapter. Did I, do you feel like, is there anything you want to add to, to that really setting with that? that? That is one of my favorite quotes. One of my favorite parts of this book is just that quote alone. Uh, and we could say it again, if I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six sharpening my ax. How many of us are spending six of our eight hours sharpening ourselves, mm -hmm. sharpening our skills, practicing role play, not just watching videos, but actually applying what we learn to impact our business. How many of us are actually doing that? And, you know, Abraham Lincoln so long ago. So imagine if he wasn't, even in existed, you know, it never existed, um, to, but to, to listen to a man that, that gave us that kind of advice. Uh, to your point of the first 11 tactics on finding business, mm -hmm. there's nothing worse than when an agent has the business in their hands or they have the best sphere anybody could ever ask for. Um, they came from the restaurant business, so they have a million people that love their customer service. They have everything that to, to, to do it. They, they're very intelligent. They have a million degrees and they communication degrees and they don't do it. Right. It, the last, the last chapter here is bulletproofing that transaction. It's, it's a masterful once that deal comes together to hold it together and to make sure that it actually goes to close. But, I just get frustrated in that there are so many agents that just don't get themselves up to bat. And I, and I really hope that through this series, we've encouraged everybody to go get more business in that, whether it's a shift or it's not a shift, that it's really a mindset first and foremost. And then there's just really tactical strategies to create a business. And then of course our, Tactic well, 12 on bulletproofing is... Well, and I think tactic 12. number 12 is... Yeah, and tactic number 12 is really where we're shifting out from being a salesperson to being a real estate agent. And, uh, you know, Gary kind of says as, as much in on pitch 242, where when he initially got into business, he writes that he had assumed that all buyers and sellers truly needed was an honest real estate agent with integrity who was willing to provide them the absolute best services possible. Um, and while that's right, he also realized that um, ultimately he had to not only, he not only had to master the transaction, but also the sales skills that went with the successful transaction. So I think yeah. tactic number 12 is really where we're shifting that headspace to being about focusing on now, like, okay, how do we keep the transactions together? What are the things that I need to do to communicate with, with my buyer or my seller? you know, what are some things that will most commonly come up that might derail a transaction and how to be mm -hmm. ahead of those things, be able to frame it um, with the buyer or the seller in, in a way that they understand and communicating it well. Yes. And that's right. And this is the time where you show up as a true professional 
and you understand that you are selling someone their biggest asset that they probably will ever own, Absolutely. that you are, you are facilitating a transaction in the hundreds of thousands, some in the millions, yep. you are facilitating that transaction. You know, when I went down to South Jersey, I worked in South, South Jersey for about six months. And um, just south of Ocean County in New Jersey, it operates very much like a Pennsylvania real estate market. Mm -hmm. And so the South Jersey agents, they write their own contracts. You know, of course, yes, our agents in New Jersey write their own contracts. Yet the agents in South Jersey write their own contracts. They don't work with attorneys and they use title companies for the closing agents. And they really have to get themselves involved in the transaction on many different levels. They wear many different hats. Uh, it's, it's almost, it's, it's, it's very, when I was, I said it's a huge liability on the brokers down there that agents truly have to transact as attorneys transact in our area. And, you know, during that time, I started to realize like the art of getting it to the closing table. And the first you know, the first 11 chapters of this book mm -hmm. can get you to the closing table and then getting from here to actually clear to close, funding is there, sellers have the keys, the walkthrough. I mean, it's really um, orchestrating a, an amazing play that you've been working for towards to put on. And then at the table, is it's all coming together. And, and it's your time to shine during this time that you can, you, you found the house, there's no more looking for a house, which quite frankly, anybody can really go get in their car and drive customers to houses, open up doors and, and mm -hmm. show a house. Enough HGTVers that yeah. we all know how to show a house, right? Yeah. And, I, and there is a skill to that 100%. However, we can do that part. Uh, cultivating the lead, finding our sphere of influence, people that we uh, relate to, that comes natural to some people. Um, it's just in all of that, there's a relationship and, well, you know, a nervousness of, well, I don't want to tell them about this in the inspection. Let, let it come from the attorney and, and there's a relationship. But when we get to chapter 12, chapter 12 is the bow of the transaction. If you can't get chapter 12, you have no check at closing. Well, so all the fun happens in the beginning. And then this last chapter, I really encourage everybody to to read through it and regardless of shift or not, you should be on top of all of these things. Yeah, I, I would echo what you're saying. I mean, in a lot of ways, this is the most important chapter because you're getting to the finish line and it's like, well, if you don't get to the finish line, then the rest of it, was it worth it? Uh, one thing that also really excites me about, uh, you know, really this chapter as I was reading through it, is that all of the tools that Gary Keller and Josh team have been working on over the last two to three years, which is to really make the consumer experience, the customer experience, the agent experience as streamlined and as easy as possible, really all boils down to this section. You know, as I was reading through this, you know, one of the things that I, you know, I was at a family reunion a couple of years ago and, and Josh had said, well, you know what? There's going to be a day where you're going to have the transaction on your mobile app when the inspection is completed, you click a checkbox, it's completed. The customer, the consumer gets an alert saying it was completed. That way they know where they are in the process. So, you know, all of these things that we've been talking about over the last couple of years and really elevating the consumer experience, it's all there now. So everything that we're going to be talking mm -hmm. about, Keller Williams agents have direct access to all of these tools in their KW Command platform, which is just, um, to me, something I, I'm looking forward to diving into over the next, you know, day and a half. Well, that's right. And so that is in their opportunities yep. applet, basically. Their opportunities applet inside their command platform. Exactly. And so um, the other thing that Diana Kokoska mentions in this, in the beginning of the chapter um, is you need to have your A team together, right? So mm -hmm. what does your A team look like? Your A team looks like hands down the brokerage that you're working with you need to make sure you have the support that you need and you have enough agents top agents agents that are learning with you if you're a top agent you have even bigger producers to be able to look up to to pit you know to uh mastermind with to ask it to throw a question out and 
I'm sure many of us have Facebook groups for agents and we actually just started up a Facebook group called, um, I believe it's Passaic Morris County agents. or Morris Passaic County Realtors so that we could just become a resource for each other, especially when we're looking for these specific people that I'm talking about. So you have your brokerage, you then have, who's the first hands on it? You have a mortgage, a mortgage a loan officer. Yep. And some people would say, well, I don't control who my buyer works with. Well, I would question you and ask you, how much influence do you have over your buyers and sellers? Mm -hmm. Have you done a full buyer consultation? And when you sit with the seller, are you convinced that you need to, um, are you, con are you convicted that they need to be convinced that they should be working with your attorney, with your, um, you know, stager on the buyer side? Are they working with your inspector? Are you working with an inspector who's not an alarmist going to point out all the major items that really do need to be prepared? prepared and give and to Matt to your point is inside of our commands we have um what is it called porch yep right yep. and that's another tool that will allow a potential buyer to see all the inspection issues that came up in the inspection and then what the estimated cost to fix everything so that it kind of just makes them feel comfortable with like oh okay the report was 15 pages long and it looks like it would only cost us like $3,000 to get all these little things fixed. Not a big deal. So we mentioned an attorney, an inspector. We don't really have control over the appraisal, the appraisers. However, we absolutely can coach anybody that comes into our transaction. You have the ability to coach them. Mm -hmm. You need to have control of this part of the transaction. Otherwise, you don't have a transaction or, or, and I've been there at the table when there's a little uh, disagreement on something that might have been taken and should have been left or something that had to be fixed and it's not fixed to the buyer's liking. I'll tell you right now, they'll take a look at you and say, well, do you think you could take it out of your commission? And if you have not held that transact, you're, you're susceptible to, uh, losing money there every lesson is expensive there's a cost to every lesson so these types of classes for you are to help you minimize those expenses for you as well for sure and 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 you know we'll talk about inspections and repairs in a minute yeah, sure. kind of dug into that and that's great you know i think to your larger point you want that team around you you want the your vendor pool that you're talking to those people you're talking to almost weekly you know, just to check in and, and really have that, yep. that, that, those, that group of people that you trust because ultimately. Well, and, and, and here, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but here's one other thing is those are the people that you've chosen. Let's just say it's your inspector, your, and, and guys, when I worked buyers, like if you were using inspector, you're using attorney. I always had a few to choose from because of behavior. You want to make sure that you're going to team the client and the vendor up appropriately, that they're going to you know, talk to each other the way they like to talk to each other. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a match. It's a match, right? Yep. And you can control those things to an extent. The, the one person you're not going to be able to control, and this is where it absolutely matters if you can lead this person, to Diana Kokoska's point, is the number one challenge we all face, and it's on page 243, is the level of the sales skill of the co-op agent, yeah. okay? Don't underestimate how much of their work you'll have to do to make this sale happen. And so that person, that co-agent, um, well, it may just be that they've never touched a transaction like that before. Yeah, and that's one of the six issues that, that we're gonna dive into in a minute, you know, because they do talk about the co-op agent and you never know whether you're working with somebody who's been doing this for 30 years and have done hundreds of transactions or somebody that it's their very first one. Um, the thing that I do want to highlight that Gary does say on page 244, and this is more kind of the mindset piece before we go into the six issues, uh, he writes, you do your deals heads down, but you save your deals heads up. Um, and ultimately, there's really four ways you can think about what might happen in any profession, professional endeavor, so not just real estate, but it's ultimately nothing will go wrong, anything could go wrong, 
something will go wrong or everything will go wrong. Uh, and ultimately, it's about being prepared to deal with whatever the future might bring. And, and one of the things that Gary uh, says about himself, and I think this is how and why he's so successful, he says, um, it's best to prepare if everything will go wrong. Ultimately, he's the most black-hatted optimist uh, that his team knows, which ultimately believes, uh, which ultimately means that, that Gary believes anything is possible in any direction. Um, he, I strive for the possible. I go after what I want to have happen. But I prepare for the worst, and I'm ready should things go wrong. Um, I have to say, I, I have to just say, he that has been his his thing since Corona started is yep. plan for the worst and hope for the best. Always plan for the worst, hope for the best. What is the worst case scenario that can happen? Plan for that, and then hope for the best. So in your transaction, it's the same. Absolutely. So. As we now dive into uh, the six major issues in getting from contract to close, uh, as Gary interviewed top agents, um, himself included, he itemized out the six bulletproofing the transaction issues and solutions. So number one is inspections and repairs. Number two is appraisals. Number three, loan approval and funding. Number four, other contingencies. Number five, the co-op agent, which we'll dive a little bit deeper into in a minute. Um, and number six is deadlines. So let's start with inspections and repairs. So some of the things that can go wrong, unexpected findings, uh, report complexity, costs and who pays for it, timetable for repairs, uh, and doubt about worthiness. Uh, so do you wanna talk about some of the solutions that are on page 247 and 248 to really handle and 249 to handle inspection issues and repairs? Sure. And understand in inspections, it's like you went and you bought your fancy car and you put your deposit on it and then you take it for a test drive and you realize it's got a little tear in the seat and it makes this funny noise when it's sitting at the light. And, and so this is what happens with a buyer that's going through an inspection and how to fix all those little quirks. So a solution for inspection issues and possibly dead deals because buyers just want to kill the deal or agents can't figure out how to negotiate an acceptable compromise right so yeah. some of the solutions are the seller gets a pre-inspection what does that look like that means that mr and mrs seller you would go ahead and you would pay for an inspection essentially it would be a couple hundred dollars out of your pocket to then be able to advertise and market that your home was pre-inspected and it's ready to go yep. and that you've addressed any issues that came up in your inspection so yep. right there isn't it better mr mr seller that you know what's going on with your home before the buyer tells you what's going on in your home yep. that i think is probably the best solution and yet here we are attend with buyer and or seller i was actually going to ask you about okay yeah i was going to ask you about that because one thing that he writes in 247 and 248 in my experience, it's best for really the buyer's agent and the, 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 the buyers to go. Yet, oftentimes I've seen when sellers attend, uh, they're very, you know, they have that, that, that personal connection to the house and the way that, that they poured into it, you know, the way it looks and all these things. And, and sometimes when sellers are at the inspection, they get almost defensive because it's like, well, you know, this, you know, because they, they, they don't want to see anything wrong with the house. Um, so, so speak about that, because in here, they, he says both of them go in, but in my experience, I usually recommend buyers to go and not the seller. Okay. So here is my experience, my opinion, and I'm interviewing a guest later on today, and she taught me this way. And I'll give you the story as to why, you know what, this is perfect. I'll give you the story as to why it would be important for that seller to be there. Okay. Number one is that seller should be there, and that seller should be quiet. You need to coach that seller that that seller should say nothing, be available, go sit in that living room, go tell them that you're gonna be in your study and that you're available. Do not follow the inspector around. However, if they have a question and they're curious, oh, everything is not explainable. Mm -hmm. And if an inspector has a question, they can answer it right there on the spot. However, the seller's agent does not need to be there, big waste of time. And the buyer's agent should be there. Maybe, I, I have to be honest, I would go for a little while. I would come back a little bit later. Once mm -hmm. the buyer and seller were comfortable with each other and the inspector was there, you know, the way to turn a two-hour inspection into a four-hour inspection, put two agents in the mix there also. 
Yeah. Okay, so that's that's that. But here's the story. So these buyers are having a home inspection and they go into the bedroom on the second floor and they look up in the ceiling and there's brown spots all in the corner. Looks like, what do you think it looks like? Mold. Mold or it's a second floor ceiling. Oh, is there water, roof? Roof, okay. Yep. So immediately you're gonna look at it and go, oh my gosh, there's a roof leak. I need a whole new roof, $10,000. Guys, roofs are only six or seven for some houses, and you could even get them down to four or five, and and you have ten thousand dollars anyway. So they look up, and the homeowner is not there. There is a huge problem. The buyer wants to kill the deal because the inspector can't figure out where that water's coming from. Yeah. You know what it was? What was it? It was a couple kids jumping on their bed with a soda can, and they opened it, and it squirted up, and the seller never wiped the ceiling. <laughs> I mean, that's how simple. So do I think buyer and seller should be there? Yeah, I think sellers should be there. I think they should be accessible. If they're not there, okay, well, call me on FaceTime if you have, and now we're in a virtual world, right? Call yep. me on FaceTime if you have any questions so I could, so I could answer it for you. Yeah. So well, to your point, a buyer feels a little more comfortable walking through the house and really picking things apart without a seller being present. Yep. And yet I do think a seller should be accessible for those questions that are that they do need to, to vis visual, you know, visually look. No, and I think that's valid. I think one thing that you touched on before, and I think it's in terms of the home inspector being part of your core group of vendors, you have your A team, it's critical because one of the things that they were talking about in the book, and it really, you know, hit me is that, you know, depending on what inspector you have, you could have an inspector going through and being like, well, this is, you know, this is, needs to be fixed or this, this, this is broken. Or, you know, if you have the right inspector who, has more of an assumptive like speech pattern where it's like, okay, you know, like, okay, we're heading towards closing, you know, this might need to be tweaked, but it, it's all about how you deliver it. Is the sky falling down or is it just, hey, you know, I recommend that this gets, you know, gets fixed or something. So uh, having the right inspector with the way that they speak to, to the client, really, really important. Um, and, and the tone that they're delivering the information in. And so to that point, there's another solution, select and supervise vendors. Mm -hmm. When you're supervising the vendor, sometimes you may have to like just jump in and say, well, Matt, I, I think what you were really trying to say to the buyer is that they should get this looked at um, from a water specialist, right? That's what you're saying. Instead of him making this like the sky is falling. And so you might have to kind of soften the message a bit. Um, in here, it also says pre-negotiated limits. There are going to be times where you're buying a fixer upper or you, you understand that this is all got to be repaired. And you may just go into it saying, look, that our buyer is understanding. Um, they will waive all inspection issues for the first $5,000. Yep. Knowing that there's a cushion of stuff that, that they won't kill the deal over. And then uh, prepare and reassure the buyer. It, um, I wanted to say something before, and this is perfect. Um, sorry, with um, you're good. I was just checking the right questions. <laughs> setting expectations is pretty much everything in life yep. and real estate, right? So setting expectations with the buyer as to what they can expect, uh, how how quickly things can get fixed. You you don't want to only tell them what the problems could be. You also want to tell them that. And then what you'll do is you'll write your wish list to your, with your attorney and then you'll go back and forth and you'll come to an agreement. Yep. So you do want to set some expectations. That's usually where people are um, thrown back by, oh my gosh. And you're like, well, listen, I, and tell them the worst. Say, we've seen in our office inspection reports come back where the buyer wants $50,000 off of the sale price. Yeah. We've seen inspection reports come back and they want $3,000 credit or just fix the doorknob and let's close. So it's all over the gamut and you need to lay that out for a buyer. So issue number two. Yep. So issue number two, let's do this one today and then we can do the other four tomorrow. Um, appraisals. So how things go wrong, won't support the price, won't support the loan or doesn't match the CMA. Okay. Um, and we've talked a little about this in, in a couple of the past uh, tactics. So some of yeah. the solutions, provide the appraiser with research, um, find additional buyer funds and appeal the appraisal. So do you want to talk a little about, I know, I think 
had, or one of the calls we were on, somebody was talking about providing the appraiser with research in advance, especially yeah. now with like some virtual showings or virtual appraisals, um, you know, where it's more difficult to see the inside necessarily. Yeah, so we are having some appraisal issues. We've had two that came back 40 and 50,000 off of what the actual sale agreed price was. Uh, what we're seeing is you may need to set some parameters around what your buyer is willing to accept. In other markets, we did see buyers waive appraisals. And I'm not saying waive the appraisal completely, and you need to make sure that your buyer is financially able to do this. Now, I want to I want to share this with you, okay? Here's a scenario. You're selling a $500,000 house. The, the borrower is putting 20% down. So they're putting down $100,000. Mm -hmm. So they are borrowing $400,000, okay? If the appraisal comes back and it says that the property is worth 480, that's $20,000 difference. That borrower can still close if they decide to waive a portion of the appraisal, mm -hmm. if and only if, they have that extra $20,000 to put down as a down payment. So whatever the property doesn't appraise at, the buyer would have to be willing to either restructure their loan altogether to kind of capture that or yep. be able to put that $20,000 down or that difference down on top of the original down payment that they would have put down. Essentially, you'd move it to a 20% of 480 instead of 500 plus that $20,000. So there are absolute ways to get around it. If your buyer is, is liquid and they have the cash, you and, and it's a property that they absolutely want, there are ways to get around it. Um, what we are seeing is uh, that the language like that would be, buyer is offering 500,000 and will waive anything um, at or above 480,000 as an appraisal price. Mm -hmm. Okay, and buyer is financially able to move forward with the 480 appraisal. Okay, mm -hmm. the other statement that you made about supplying the appraisers with information. A lot of appraisers, as we know, will go, "No, nah, I'm good. I don't. I, I don't want your stuff. Yeah. I get yeah. it." And here's the challenge that we have right now in today's market: one, very few appraisers are working. It's okay if people have made a decision to not work during this time. So what we're finding is those aggressive amazing souls that do want to still work are traveling from possibly south jersey north jersey out of area yeah. and they may not know the communities or the properties like a local appraiser might know because the same house that we see in Passaic county sitting in middlesex county is same exact house is a different price because of location and supply and demand and needs and so what I'm going to advise you to do during this time, even though you'll tell me, well, the appraiser didn't want, you do everything you can to get whatever video and comps, comparative, comparative properties that have recently closed. If you call, there's under contracts in the neighborhood that matter. You call that other co-broke agent, I mean, the other agents, and you ask them, hey, you know, can you, can you kind of give me an idea of where you're landing? Because we're trying to get appraised over here at 123 Main at 500,000. Mm -hmm. And so when we say you want to supply those appraisers with, with data, you, want to, you don't want to just go to the MLS and print out whatever's there because they have that. You need to go and you need to, you know, really put your case together and send it over to them or package it nicely and give it to them. Uh, yep. Leave it for them when they go to do the appraisal. But the drive-by appraisals are definitely affecting us because they're not being able to get in to see what, you know, we were talking about the functionally obsolete. If if somebody took down a a, a wall to make a three-bedroom into a two-bedroom, a two-bedroom house is very challenging to market because a lot of buyers will look for, they'll put that three in there. Yep. And then it knocks mm -hmm. out all of the two to, you know, the two. You'll still, you'll see the four, you'll see the three, but you won't see the two. Uh, so that would be a challenge and that would affect the value of that house. Yep. However, mm -hmm. if the appraiser is just looking at it on its tax record, it's going to think it's the same house that's over there 
and you know it's going to be a skewed value so understand how this is all affecting us like this is where our, our brains do have to enter in rather than our personality and our communication skills our, our knowledge or and, and our uh our knowledge that we need to share with our clients is, is imperative yeah the, the last thing i just want to touch on real quick because i i think number three loan approval and funding i know we don't have too long i think the the one thing I just wanted to make a comment on that before we, we break for today is just ultimately it's just saying make sure that your buyers get pre-approved, which honestly, that's something that should be done before, you know, we're even at this stage. So um, I would say that's really what, what number three is saying, yet I do just want to highlight on page 253 um, this little chart here, which just says the seven don'ts of mortgage funding. So, if, you know, when your buyers are ready to buy a home, they're excited to do all this stuff. And it's saying the seven don'ts. Number one, don't change your employment status. Number two, don't make any major purchases. So cars, furniture, home theater, vacation. Number three, don't increase your credit card debt. Number four, don't change bank accounts or make undisclosed large deposits. Number five, don't apply for a credit card. Um, number six, don't spend money you have set aside for closing. Not ever. And number seven, don't delay in providing all paperwork asked for by the mortgage company. So make sure you're getting those on time. Um, right. You want to add anything to that real quick? I do only in that. I, I just want to bring it to, to, to today, to today's, yeah. to today's yeah. temperature, right? When we look at those seven and this is what, you know, I got to add to number three, the issue mm -hmm. is number seven. If we look at some, I mean, if we look at these seven things, the first one, right? Don't change your employment status. Well, about. 25% of America has changed their employment status. Yeah. You may be in contract with somebody. I, I asked the question yesterday on Mortgage Monday. And, you know, if you're somebody who has been let go of your job and you're in a contract and you go and get yourself another job, but it's not in the same field. Yeah. Or in my, in my brother-in-law's case a couple years ago, he got another job right away and yet it wasn't a contract job it was a the way it was the way it was set up in the paperwork he obviously he stayed working for them but the way it was set up it was not comparable to the banking institution to say this guy is a safe risk that we're going to lo loan him this money okay so don't make any major purchases well that that's a probably okay don't increase your credit mm -hmm. card debt I'm sure that right now your buyers that are in contract or your buyers who are thinking they might be increasing their credit card yeah. debt. So there may be some things that you're looking at this list on page 253 saying, I think that three or four of my buyers just knocked themselves out. Yeah. Well, that's not necessarily the case. However, they may have changed their approval that they originally had with the bank. So I would encourage everybody that has, if you have somebody that's pre-approved or you've gone through that process with them and you've done a buyer consultation, I'm going to encourage you to go back and, and revisit again with that loan officer and that client, maybe do a zoom with them to check in, to make sure all of the, the, the pieces that make the mortgage or break the mortgage, they're still in line. They're still in alignment with being approved to get a mortgage. Um, on the other side is that some of our people were approved for loans that aren't there anymore. There are some loans that have disappeared and some funding that is a little risky. And so some of us may need to put more money down that, that we weren't thinking we had to, or maybe just cannot be approved because that was the only product we fit in. Okay. So just because you got through the process and you're now like under contract, I will encourage every single agent out there. If you have what a great touch, Mr. Buyer, I'm concerned. I just want to check in with your loan officer and make sure everything's in line for us to keep moving forward the way we've been. So that's my one nugget is I would just say I'm hearing some nightmare stories and some really great successes. And yet it all depends on do you have a relationship with your loan officer? and pick up the phone right now and make sure that all of your clients are still in good standing to move forward and purchase. And if they're not, know where they're at. Yep. And 
This is not a time to say, oh, I don't get involved with my, my customer's finances. I yeah. leave that to the mortgage officer. I yeah. know like you, my yeah. voice changes, right? Because I'm talking like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, guess what? You're a professional and we sell houses. We change lives through selling houses. Yeah. And yeah. you got to kind of get into their finances right now. Absolutely. Well, no. So, so yeah. So I think that's a good place to stop for today because we tackled the first three uh, most common challenges. Tomorrow we'll do the next three, but then also the end of the chapter talks about uh, communication efforts uh, with with your clients. So that'll segue into that. Yeah, basically like a flow chart. You guys should be having a flow chart uh, if it's not electronically and inside of a system like we do have that in command. Yep. You should at least have, and even if you have it in command, I still, I'm a visual person as you can see. I, I have lots of paper here and it's always nice to be able to keep your notes in some sort of flow chart with all of your clients so that you are checking in on everybody. So awesome. thank you, Matt. This was Shift Tack to 12 part one. Tomorrow we'll do part two. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Wash your hands. Bye. <laughs>